Hello everyone to another episode of Average Ontario Anglers Podcast. Today we are on episode 5 with the theme is going to be Ice Out Pike, which spring is is starting or has started and uh, I am excited for open water fishing again. How about you, Jesse? Oh, I've been dreaming about this for so long. <laughs> so as you have probably already guessed, my name is Andrew and co-host today as usual is Jesse. So we're, we're going to jump right in today with the interesting fishing fact, which Jesse has prepared for us. And to follow our tradition, I'm going to rate his interesting fishing fact. I believe I was using a number grade and you were using a letter grade. Yes. So I'm, I'm hoping for an A plus with this one because I know what Andrew likes and Andrew likes history and he likes old lures. So this interesting fishing fact is going to get an A. So our interesting fishing facts <laughs> of episode five is about the classic lure the jitterbug nice the jitterbug okay now if you're not familiar with the jitterbug it's probably one of the most popular topwater lures for like the last like 80 years pretty much it's super popular it's that it's that little crazy looking topwater with the big metal cupped lip and when you cast it out and reeled in it just made by arbogast weird. one of my favorite vintage lure. fishing lure I it's still in operation today but 100 of the vintage lures are one of my favorites to collect and we're going to talk about that guy because he's nice. about the interesting fishing fact so cool. I'll ask Andrew, because he probably knows this. When did the jitterbug come out? About what time? I would say 50, some 40s or 50s. 1938. Okay. So pretty, pretty long time ago it came out. And you have to admit, this lure, though, it's synonymous. That's the new word that I learned for this. Word of the day is synonymous with bass fishing. Yes. If someone bass fishes or their grandpa bass fish and you open their tackle box, they probably have a jitterbug in it. If, right? if anyone who's like 60 or 70 years old sees some bait in the surface of the water making bubbles, it's like, is that a jitterbug? Yep, it's a jitterbug. <laughs> and for me personally, uh, my dad doesn't use a lot of lures, but one of his favorite lures was the frog colored jitterbug. You know, the one that's like green with the black dots on the back? I, I own one, yes. Yeah, so do I. And like that to him, like to me, it's a very nostalgic lure because that was his lure. Like he had a few lures that he used, but that was the main one he always loved using. So anyway, it's just, it's a crazy amazing lure made by Fred Arbergast. So also who is from Ohio, USA, just as a side point. But these were originally made out of wood like most modern or most vintage lures were, right? Yeah. But uh, eventually they made them out of plastic. And I think, I don't think I've ever held a wooden one myself. All the ones I've had have been plastic, but they still have that classic metal cupped uh, yes. face plate lip that makes them have the crazy uh, gurgling sound. But the interesting thing is in 1942, because of World War II, there was actually a production run of them with plastic lips because <laughs> of the ammunition. Uh, companies weren't allowed to use a lot of metal, so they actually had to make the lip out of plastic. <laughs> and they had a bunch of different colors, which I, I think it would be cool if they brought it back just as limited edition because they had like uh, yellow lips, like not clear yellow, just like full out yellow plastic. They had black, they had red, they had a whole bunch of different colors. And if you look them up online, they look sick. Like I'd buy one 100%. Cool. Who's to say if the action was exactly the same, but I'm sure it was pretty good. Um, another interesting thing is about uh, the guy Fred Arbogast himself. So like th that guy was a like a legend of his time, kind of like, you know, the Bob Izumi, but <laughs> back in the olden <laughs> days. But uh, he was the inventor of many popular lures that are still popular now. Mm -hmm. And that says a lot because like he invented a lot of these lures in the early 1900s and they're still being sold in mass quantities today. The cool thing about this guy, Fred Arbogast, he was actually a very good competitive caster. Hmm. So I didn't know this, but apparently back in the early 1900s, there was, they had tournament casting competitions. And apparently um, Fred Arbogast was, he was one of the top champion caliber casters and he had a few world records to his name. Wow. Now I'm just thinking like gear has changed so much, but imagine back in the day, like in the twenties and thirties, the fishing equipment they had was literally nothing like it is now I've, I've casted some some reels both a like bait caster style a casting reel and a spinning reel from i think the one the reel i have spinning reel is i think is from the 50s and the bait caster i have is from i think the 60s and they cast like crap oh they're terrible <laughs> and like, like they're not refined at all like cast. they are now but imagine being that good back then with yeah. that equipment imagine how good he'd be with stuff now yeah you know so like this guy was like apparently just like 
you know, a sniper with a fishing rod. The guy could cast like, and he was winning competitions. The old like, world record grips. Oh yeah, <laughs> super short and fiberglass rods and like, oh. and like, just imagine the old line they had back then. Well, I remember when I, I sorry, a little side tangent to the interesting fact, but we were camping in Algonquin Park, and I decided to use my old Head and Pal uh, push button reel combo that I had given to me, and that thing is fiberglass. I it took me. 20 minutes before I could cast the thing more than 30 feet with like an aglia spinner like it, I, I could not cast that super whippy so anyway this guy was a you know a very accomplished uh, fisherman and he was obsessed with fishing like this guy was obsessed with fishing there's actually a whole biography about this guy it's like 120 pages long but just this one guy <laughs> and uh, he back in the day he studied bass behavior so that was his main thing he studied bass behavior so that he could design lures that drove them insane. Hmm. So you have to think like back in the day, like now there's so many copies of like poppers and, and uh, jitterbugs and stuff like that. But like he's the one that made them popular. Like he thought that in his head, like the jitterbug must have looked kind of gimmicky back then. Yeah. But just the way that it, it plops through the water and has that crazy bubble trail behind it. Think of how much research and like prototypes he made to get to that point where he's like, this particular lure is gonna drive fish insane for the next hundred years and it does yeah like imagine how much tinkering or how smart this guy was so definitely that that's the awesome. interesting fact is how much of a beast this guy was a legendary angler was fred arbogast from the early 1900s and he's designed so many lures and like we know a few of them like offhand that are the most popular is the jitterbug and the hula popper yep and they're still slamming fish to this day so like old lures still work and the old lures designed back in the day the bass still hate them or love them they just smash them so i thought that was interesting because andrew likes old vintage lures yes. and like jitterbug to me again it's dear to my heart because it's something that's nostalgic but if you don't own a jitterbug and you fish for smallmouth largemouth musky 100 percent get one yeah my dad's caught walleye on them too so one of my favorite of the arbogast lures is the arbogaster i believe it's called and it's one of the first square-lipped crankbaits hmm. like again like that thing has all the properties of a square lip crankbait today like you can fish it around timber like that's I don't know if that was part of his process in designing it, but it doesn't wouldn't surprise me at this point now. Yeah. <laughs> like I can totally see him and thinking. I know of now that. Fred Arbogast, like their company, like obviously he's, he's long dead, but mm -hmm. um, it's owned by Pradco, which owns like a whole bunch of different I'm pr I'm pretty sure it's Pradco. Hmm. But they're sold through that. So there's all kinds of new jitterbugs. Like, you know, there's the jointed the jitterbug. They had the brought size jitterbug. They have the two point which looks yeah. pretty good. Yeah, the jointed ones and have the updated paint schemes. They look they look good. And but again, they have the classic lip because yeah, you can't beat that. The classic lip. And my favorite way to fish a jitterbug, just as a side tangent, I love the black jitterbug at night. Yes. If you're out at night and it's just like, you know, the moon's out and it's just like flat water and you whip out a jitterbug and you don't have to see the lure, you can know how fast to reel it in just by when you hear that perfect pop, 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 pop and you see the little bubble trail behind it in the moonlight and then a bass yep. just comes up and smokes it. That to me, that's top water fishing. It's so fun. My first decent walleye was caught on a black jitterbug at night. And yeah, I was casting out, reeling in, and then I would stop and I'd dead stick it. And you could hear the fish just nipping at it because it was just silent, like flat water. And just, and the hooks are rattling on the bottom as they're hitting this thing, just not even moving in the water. That was at Algonquin? Uh, that was at Moira. Oh, okay. Yeah, that Moira. was, we camped at Moira at a buddy's empty lot. <laughs> good times. Anyway, that was the interesting fishing fact. So what's your rating of that? I like, that was good. That's, that's an A. A plus. That was. I don't yeah. know how you're gonna top that one. That one was good. I like A it. A plus. He, he geared that to to me and not See, any of the listeners. So I, I apologize to all our listeners. I have a technique. <laughs> you got to give people what they want to hear. And Andrew <laughs> wants to hear old lure stuff. Then I give him old lure stuff. Right. Don't worry. Next fish. Interesting fishing fact should be better because Andrew's doing it. It's <laughs> <laughs> anyway. not true, and I've geared it to you. So we're okay. also cutting out everyone else. <laughs> if you're listening to this, I apologize that I made you learn about some old guy who invented lures. Enjoy what I enjoy, people. It's great. <laughs> All right. So to our main topic, ice out pike. So I know a lot of people, they, they, everyone's looking forward to open water. I know some guys like the weirdos out there prefer ice fishing over open water. I'm just kidding. You guys are great. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I love open water. I like ice fishing, but open water is where it's at for me. And the first thing one of the first species that I target with open water is pike. Same here. And I think like one of the biggest, or the most obvious question would be for some that are newer in the angling community would be why fish for pike? So I know for myself, I've got to list a couple of reasons why I like fishing for pike in the spring. First of all, 
They're a cold water fish, so they're aggressive. They come in shallow, they're getting ready for the spawn, or they might be uh, mid or just after post-spawn. Depends what time in the spring you're, you're fishing for them. But they're accessible, they're plentiful, they taste good if you want to eat them. Very and, good. And Surprisingly good. Really good. And yeah. when you hook into them, especially in the cold water, they fight better in cold water than they will in the heat of summer. 100%, yeah. yeah. Like I noticed, though, like, yeah, we'll go ice out pike fishing, and you'll hook a pike, not a big one, like three, four pounds, and it, they fight good. Yeah. Yeah. In the summer, you'll hook into it, and it just comes in like a giant flasher into the boat. Yeah. <laughs> Spinning, <laughs> like not even moving. It's like, oh, I just hooked a wet sock with teeth. <laughs> it's like a nightmare. So what, uh, are, there, are there any other reasons you would point to as to why, like, spring pike is so good as a good op- opportunity if you want to get in the water in the spring and you want to go for something sooner than you know when bass season opens in a couple months yeah like what else would you do like and it was crappy fishing but that can be tougher it's tougher and tougher to find them these days mm-hmm. and a lot of people to catch them from a shore very limited shore access where you're going to be on crappy waters whereas pike you can go lake ontario anywhere on the shoreline uh, in bays rivers they start coming in right you can go on your if they're in season if yeah if of course you always follow, follow your guidelines but i mean the the fact is they're there whether or not you can legally catch them but and i think that's the main draw is because like they're there pike kind of get a bad rep from a lot of people they're like oh i don't want to you know get those slimy things in the boat but like <laughs> spring is the time when they come shallow and yeah. they're accessible to a lot of people so like if you don't have a boat or, or a kayak or whatever now's the time of year where you can catch potentially giant pike like over 40 inches close to shore you know, and like Andrew said, there's lots of places you could fish them at, like River Mouse, at the lake, and there's all, all the Kawartha lakes have them. And like, if you live in Northern Ontario, you know, it may, I, I'm not 100% familiar with their regulations, but like down here anyway, there's mm-hmm. there's lots of opportunity in the spring to catch them. And no one fishes for them. Very yeah. few people. Yeah. Which is great. Great for me. Sometimes when the steelhead and creek is like, you know, thick and there's tons of guys out there. Yeah. It's like me and Andrew have had days where we're like, I don't want to stand shoulder to shoulder float fishing. And then we'll throw the boat in or the canoe into you know, like a local place for pike and we'll have a good day pike fishing and we won't see anyone on the water. We'll yep. be all by yourself. I love that. For sure. So where are the pike then in the spring? We kind of, like we, we danced around a bit. We've mentioned a couple things. But exact th- GPS coordinates, please. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh I thought you were going to tell them. No, 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 <laughs> no, definitely not. So in the, in the spring, they are like for this time of year, they're in pre-spawn. Uh, I actually, I forgot to look up what, temperature of water that they go but the average person isn't looking at temperatures of water for when they actually want to i have it written smile. down you actually research this as well well because my interesting fishing fact was going to be about pike but then i thought it'd be boring to have an interesting fishing fact about pike and then an episode about pike fishing. okay so, so so what do you have there uh so like andrew said pike spawn it depends where you are any t- uh, any time between march and may so like early march sometimes like a lot of the bays and stuff they're still frozen mm-hmm. um but they can spawn under the ice actually which is interesting but I feel like, like, we'll talk about this, like, when have you personally seen spawning pike? Like, I generally don't see them spawning in early March. They yeah. probably do 100%. I just don't see it. When I see them spawning, it's usually, like, April, yeah. like, even, April-ish, Even beginning of May. Yeah. Beginning of May and into then, depending on the year, too, right? And you have to how, think, they close mild, pike but... season in, in April. Like, it's yeah. closed for one month in April, and that's generally when they spawn. Yeah. But the temperatures you're going to look at is between 40 and 45 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about four to seven degrees. So that's when they kind of start spawning. So like, that's pretty cold. Like Andrew said, they're cold water fish, yeah. four degrees. Like that's literally just after ice out. The water's like ice cold. hundred percent. So yeah. just like, you know, a lot of people are, are familiar with, with kind of the salmon life cycle, how when salmon are getting ready for their spawn and they spawn up at the rivers, they do what's called staging. So they come in and they will... Uh, hang out in front of river mouths. That's why they have the big salmon derbies and stuff like that. And then once the spawn starts, they start moving into those creeks. So the same thing happens with pike. Pike will actually stage up. They'll start moving into the areas where they're going to have their spawn early. So that's why even if it's pre-spawn for them, as soon as the ice is out and you can actually start casting, or if you're ice fishing, they're pretty shallow water too. But when the ice is out, they are shallow because they're getting ready to be in those spawning grounds. So spawning grounds for pike are in in general is shallow warm bays or or rivers where the current is low so if it's in a river look for like a a back bay something like that that's most likely where the pike would spawn if you're fishing early season pike then 
you'd want to kind of fish around those areas, moving where the fish are coming in from the deeper water from the main lake to get to that area. So fish downstream of that, fish around the outskirts of those shallow weedy bays, stuff like that. That's where you can find pike, essentially, in the early spring. And even post-spawn, they move just out of those weeds or just on the edge of those weeds because weeds are where all the forage fish are as well. Especially if you're looking for bigger fish, because like yeah. I, I think that a lot of the small males stay shallow for longer, and the, f- yes. the big females are like, as soon as they're done spawning, they may sulk for a few days, and then phew, they shoot down to that first deep weed line. Yeah. So like if you're if you're fishing and just catching dinks, go a little bit deeper, and you might be surprised. Hundred percent. Same thing. Even even in the warmer weather, a lot of people that are used to catching smaller pike in the summer when they're bass fishing, stuff like that. But you're generally going to catch hammer handles. That's mm-hmm. because pike don't actually like the warm temperatures they're in the deeper colder water than at you know spring fed creek mouth stuff like that that's where you're going to find the big pike because the warm temperatures where you're going to have all these little hammer handles in there which is slang for a small pike snot rocket (laughs) snot rocket yeah (laughs) little crocodile so they they'll stay in the warm temperatures just because it's safe they're they could get eaten by a larger pike or by a mosquito devils in the waters. But the big pike who have established themselves in that system, they're going to be in the cold water, which in the spring, thankfully, is accessible because it's right up on shore. Yeah. <laughs> and I know there's a lot of, there's not a lot, but there's some guys that, you know, we see on Instagram and they're fishing out in fairly big water in like, you know, small boats or in kayaks and stuff this time of year. Mm-hmm. And they catch giant pike. I'm talking like over 40 inch pike. And it's, very accessible like it's it's not something crazy like you don't need an expensive boat you don't need like a bass boat and pan optics and all this stuff to go find these fish like they're literally within casting range of shore a lot of times yeah so it's it's great for any skill level like here go out and chuck a jerk bait or you know we'll get into gear but like you don't need a lot of stuff it can be very simple yeah and even even during winter time if you're ice fishing stuff like that again this is going to be all about spring pike but just Knowing the behavior of pike will help no matter what time of year you're going for them. Mm -hmm. So pike in general, uh, they are an ambush predator. So they don't cruise around like lake trout. They don't really hold the structure too much. Like they can, they they hold to some structure. But at the same time, they're roaming around. They're looking for those schools of, of shad, whatever they can feed on. Pike are an ambush predator. They're not cruising around open water hoping to find like a big bait ball of fish. Pike are going to be sitting in weeds, sitting around like hard structure. And then as soon as something comes into their strike zone, they go into that S formation and then just shoot out. They are actually the fastest freshwater fish in the world. Hmm. And it's as an instant burst of speed. So when you're going for pike, looking for pike, look for something they're going to be holding to, hiding, hiding in to ambush your prey from. So that's where pike tend to be whenever they're feeding. So even, again, during pre-spawn, post-spawn, they're still going to be near those weedy areas. The water temperature is still cool enough to hold them there, and they're going to be ambushing prey. So if you're fishing a weed line, you can be fishing some, you know, like a chatterbait or a jerkbait right on the outside of those weeds or right above the weeds, and pike will come out of nowhere and just smack it. And they're like eerily camouflaged sometimes. They'll come out of literally nowhere, and you're like, there was nothing there, and a pike will just appear beside the boat and hail your bait. I can't tell you how many times at the cottage, like, we're a cottage on a river, and the river is, is quite deep. The river's 60 feet on average, its depth. And it slopes down really quickly on its shoreline. Like, yeah. I know Jesse's, like, we grew up fishing that. You jump off the dock and you're in 20 feet of water. Yeah. So, and the dock's only 10 feet out into the river. So, the, uh, the, the, sh- the weed line at that river is, you maybe have four or five feet of weeds between the shore, and then it's too deep for weeds to grow. It drops off so quick, but... So when you're standing on the dock, you can see the outside edge of that weed line. And I can tell you how many times I'll be reeling in a bait and then a pike sitting right beside the dock just comes out of nowhere. Like I, I was just swimming there. I was casting there 50 times and it, I literally see it shoot out from like eight inches water in the weeds and smokes it. Like yeah. it blows my mind how these things can hide in the thickest of weeds. And that's the thing. They are top predator ambush hunters like yeah that's what they're designed to do yeah and they're literally good at it and i just want to before we go further we forgot to mention this sp- who's sponsoring today's giveaway yes totally forgot so <laughs> today's sponsor has nothing to do with pike fishing but um today we have paired up with kite fish quality flies now if you're into steelhead fishing uh, or trout fishing you probably know matt from kite fish because he 
sells tons of his pink worms and and beads and pegs and all his steelhead fishing accessories definitely check him out we've been buying stuff from matt for years like the first bead i ever bought when i caught a fish on it was from matt <laughs> i bought it at ganyon sports but the prize that he's donated for this is five packs of plastics one pack of pegs and five packs of beads so that's really a good value um, it's definitely if you already have some steelhead stuff but you want to add to your collection or if you have literally nothing he's going to get you set up for trout season the little pink worms some little i don't know what he's going to give because you're going to have to talk to him about that but he's going to ship that actually directly to you so that's a really good prize we'd like to thank matt again for sponsoring this 100%. and uh again if you're a company that would like to sponsor a giveaway on our podcast please let us know awesome anyway continue andrew back to our regular programming yes <laughs> thanks so <laughs> After these messages, we'll be right back. Anyways. There's no like random stops of advertising in this podcast because, you know, we're not going to do that. But that was as close as it's going to get. So yeah. thanks, guys. Right. So anyways, back to fishing for pike. Ah, yes. <laughs> so what are pike eating in the spring? What do you think they're eating, Jesse? Uh, minnows? Primarily, yeah. Yeah. So frogs aren't out yet. They will eat them 100%. Yeah. But frogs aren't out in the water yet they're probably still like burrowed they're in still the mud. burrowed in the mud yeah, yeah. so uh pike they they will eat crayfish but generally they're not rooting around in the bottom looking for crayfish like a bass would mm -hmm. so they are waiting for smaller game fish so it could be smaller bass could be perch just on everyone's you know <laughs> every fish eats a perch pretty much mm -hmm. um i've i've caught them on worms before yeah, I they too. will. Yeah, but primarily they're going to be looking for uh, like S bait fish, smaller pike too. They're yeah, can smaller pike. Yeah, so so if it if it's swimming and it can fit in their mouth, they can actually eat something one third of their length. They can successfully catch, eat, swallow, not choke to death on it. Something a third of their length. Imagine Andrew eating a two. 0.2 foot long submarine sandwich. <laughs> I mean, I can actually imagine that because he eats a lot of food, but. <laughs> But yeah, like that's that's and, pretty impressive. And it's not just the length; like, like you have to consider then that's also something of that girth on that size as well. Like you, they can fit big bass. We've caught literally dead walleye that choked on a little bluegill. Yeah, and here's a pike literally eating something a third of its size. Yeah. no problem. You can get a you know a thirty inch pike that is eating a ten inch walleye. It's crazy. <laughs> that's pretty cool. So, so yeah, anything that's that's working. So the lures you'd want to use would be like spinners, spoons. Especially in the spring, using something that's a little bit slower is is good. So jerk baits are fantastic. Probably the best overall lure yeah. you could use. I, like it's, like we talked about before, like the X wrap for pike for me works really well. If you want to hear about that, make sure you check out our episode three. Our top yeah, our episode episode three top lures. Yeah, no no episode two top yes. lures. Episode three was we talked line. a whole. We're already getting confused. Bait. It's like we've done a bunch of episodes. It's just like we've been doing this for years. <laughs> What, what, if you could Too only, bad it doesn't sound like it. We're yeah. very green. <laughs> if you could only have one pike lure for the spring, what would it be? Jerkbait. 100%. Hard or soft? Hard. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I, I would want... I do like a... Like, an axe wrap is great because, again, we talked two trebles. I don't miss pike on the axe wrap. They inhale like, it. Yeah. 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 They smoke that thing. And the so two good, strong trebles on an axe wrap and... You can fish it at any speed. So if they're more aggressive that day, fish it fast. If it's gotten real cold again or it's really early season, fish it real slow. Put long pauses in your retrieve. They're still going to be waiting for something to come by and it's going to pause in front of their face. They're going to go for it still. Yeah, because they're cold water fish, like you said, but they're also cold blooded. So when the water's like 40 degrees, like they're really slow. Yeah. They may attack things, but like they may. They need that opportunity they're just to gonna attack. They're slowly it. go up to your bait, and if it's just sitting there, they're going to eat it. Yeah. So, like long pauses. That's Cause, why. Because again, does well too, in the spring. you think of every other fish as well. All fish are cold blooded. The rest of the fish will also be moving slow. So, if you're fishing something unnaturally fast in sure. super cold yeah. water, you're not going to catch stuff because like nothing. Don't do E. They can't run or. <laughs> yeah. <like they're laughs> So, you know, all the bait fish that the pike are going to be used to and will try to attack are going to be moving sluggishly as well. Yeah. So, like, one of the spoons, what, what would you say your favorite pike spoon would be? I know I have mine. I know you have yours. I would have to say a Len Thompson 
Fire Tiger. They, I think it's like their platinum series. It's yeah. silver on the, the back. I know a guy who Fire swears Tiger. by the Len Thompson Five of Diamonds. Like yeah, he, he, that, that's his pike. I, I pike like the Len Thompson. Like, there's a lot of good spoons. Yeah, but I, I think the Len Thompson for me, it's I don't know what size number it is, but it's the one that's three quarter ounce. Mm-hmm. It's not huge, but it's just just the wobble to me. There's something about it. it. Just for me, that I have a lot of confidence in that. For me, mine is the Williams Wobbler. Yep, the, the hammered silver. Just straight hammered silver. That that to me is one of the best pike spoons, especially in the spring. Now, again, if you're casting from shore, you're not going to be able to cast that very far. It's thin. It's very thin gauge steel. The benefit of it, though, is you don't want to reel it in too fast. You need to get that perfect speed where it just is, is wobbling back and forth through the water. And that little sachet as it comes through, mm-hmm. you can slow roll that on top of weeds, like of, of the emerging weeds and stuff like that, uh, on a drop off. And to me, that speed is like perfect of just some like big sluggish alewife, just like yeah, it actually like is perfect. half dead. It imitates around. that perfectly. Yeah, that size profile. Yeah. So I, for me, that's my favorite. And they have you know good strong hooks in them right out of the box. I love it. Most spoons do in general, yeah. Yeah. but the, the three quarter spoon. ounce spoons I find are are a bit more difficult to fish slow because you're not going get to get that action. They work great. Yeah. So when the water temperature can deem you to do something a bit faster on the retrieve then yeah, I'll go from the Williams because you can't reel them fast and keep their action to something a bit heavier. Mm-hmm. So yeah, Len Thompson would be my second choice. Another spoon that I've done pretty good. I'd say not not earlier in the season, but as the season progresses a little and the fish become more active is the Johnson Silver Minnow, which is another classic old yeah. lure. And the thing is, because it has a weed guard, yep. you can actually chuck it up in into some weeds and not have to worry about snagging. Which and is even like good. fish it down into the top of the weeds a little bit. So you're actually taking the top of those weeds and not yeah. picking them up. And there's so many good spoons. Like yeah. we all have our favorites and everyone says the, their favorite is the best, but like, let's be realistic. There's so many good spoons. They're popular with a lot of different people. Pick the one that you have the most confidence in and you're going to catch fish on it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Pike loves spoons. hundred percent. And then, and as the water gets warmer, I'll transition uh, you know, I'll keep using jerk baits year round because again, you can fish them any speed you oh, need. Oh, they're to. fantastic! Uh, but instead of spoons, I'll often go to uh, a spinner. You know, yeah. if there's a cold day, then I'll go back to a spoon. But in the hot summer summer days, I would I love fishing like a, a big maps or something like that, like an Aglia long. Yep. Yeah, yeah. yeah I love that. Or, or a big Black Fury, even. Yeah. You know, something. They like that black color. color. I have a Black yeah. Fury with. Uh, a black marabou uh, feather treble that I tied, and that thing smashed fish. Yeah, lots of lots of pike. Yeah, actually, my favorite. Like, I like spinners, but you remember at the cottage, I love a spinner bait just because it's similar to a spinner, but you can actually retrieve it through you know logs and and, and weeds and stuff like that, and actually come through. And pike love them. Yep, I've well, we, had more pike destroy spinner baits than anything. Hundred percent. But and pike like pink. Oh, they do. They love it. Any, I think anything bright and visual, because yeah. pike are very visual feeders. They like that. They like white. They like chartreuse. They like pink. But 100%. one cool thing, though, I have to mention, in the early spring when they're like in very shallow water, yep. one fantastic lure, and we learned this a few years ago, is uh, like not a jerk bait, but like a minnow bait, like a original rapala, the mm. original floating, because it's so shallow. Sometimes you're fishing in like literally 18, 20 inches of water, and these pike are just like in these shallow areas is something that floats because then you can cast it out and just slowly reel it and let it you know dive down only like maybe a foot and then if say like there's a bunch of weeds just let it float up pull it over those weeds and then reel it down again yep. and it really helps you fish effectively the shallow water because if you check a jerk bait in a lot of them dive you know down you know four or five feet you're instantly just going to snag yep. weeds so that floating minnow bait I love the, the the jointed r- rapala I've caught lots of oh, pike on, classic. on the classic jointed classic. rapala um, another thing too is something that you know a lot some people might think might not think of as a pike bait but uh swim jigs and chatter baits 100 percent. so like primarily people might think of those as a bass lure as bass lures but how many times you have bitten off by a pike oh. <laughs> while fishing for bass and those things too many times and when i tie them on and i'm targeting pike i smash fish like mm-hmm. it's it's awesome in white just get a white swim yep. jig or chatter bait and you're good yeah i know it's a really good pike chatter bait just to add the big blade chatterbait they have this one yes i don't even know what color it's called it's called something weird like coleslaw or something i don't know but it's got like a bright orange blade and the big blade has a big blade on yeah. it. yeah and then the the skirt is like a mixture of white chartreuse and orange and then i put a nut like a huge six inch kaolin's white grub on it 
you reel that thing through the water and it's just like, I know just vibrating, but then it's got this big <laughs> white tail, just, you know, like just undulating behind it and pike love it. I've also caught bass on it, but pike love it. Yes. So let's have a little bit of story time here. Okay. Story time. I'll, I'll put you on the spot. You know, cause well, you I can... have a lot of people message me and they're like, we love the podcast, but we'd like to hear more stories. Yeah, and I'm like, perfect, man. that's good. But some of our stories are boring. So hopefully this is a good one. <laughs> Well, I'm going to ask for a good one. So okay. what's your best spring pike experience? Now, you can't say the one I'm thinking of. <laughs> Was it the one where we almost capsized? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's a good story. Or we though. can just tell that one really well together. Okay. There's always that time of year when you're like, we got to get out late March. We got to get out. And some years, the winter just like, like, like this year, winter just held on and got a lot of snow and it just doesn't happen but yeah. some the water's years, not opening up there's a magical time when the last week of march the water's perfect there's no ice and you get out and there's tons of pike there yeah. and we learned that this day yeah and this is before we had <laughs> you know my sports boat we had andrew's portage canoe yeah yeah so the algonquin canoe yeah and uh so yeah so we, we went out but we it was the in. last day of march it was yeah. the last day so we we went out and around the shore we were actually pushing through ice like yeah. there's like when the ice is my favorite time of the ice when it starts to break up and it turns into like little ice shards it looks like ice bobbers and you're pushing through and it's like it's like crackling around you yeah so we push out we're, we're ice breaking through in my canoe yeah <laughs> and then uh it's very canadian yeah and then we we actually threw some timbits on the on the ice trying to see if it would break yeah i was like how thick is this ice so i dropped a timbit don't ask it very just, like, canadian skittered along the ice i was like it is thick so uh, we started fishing around the the old bull rushes and stuff in the in the bay, and it was, the wind was kind of picking up. It was slightly windy, but we were like, you know, what? we fished in this plenty of times before. We weren't concerned, and so we were killing it on the pike. We caught, I caught two like nice nice pike that I actually kept that day. I think we caught seven pike in in half an hour. Yeah, it was like cast boom five minutes later, cast boom, and they were all decent sized pike. Like they yeah. weren't giants, but they were good fish. Yeah, and. We were just catching, I, I think we were using like minnow baits and jerk baits. I used my X-Wrap a lot yep. on that day. And they were really shallow I don't think I took day. my X-Wrap off because I was, you were using swim baits and you were having success in your swim bait and stuff. Yep. But yeah, I, I couldn't just keep them off the hook with the X-Wrap, so why not keep using it? Unfortunately. And, <laughs> so we were fishing down this, this shoreline and we're going into more and more sheltered area, like further from them, excuse me, further from the main lake. So we didn't realize that as we go back, the wind seems like the same but it was actually getting worse. We were just heading into more sheltered area. <laughs> and all of a sudden we look and we're seeing like white caps out, out near the front of the bay again, where we have to, where we're parked our car, where the launch is, where we have to go back. And we're like, okay, what, what are we going to do? And so we start trying to, we turn around and we start heading back. And as soon as you get past this one point, the waves just start hitting this canoe. Like it's, it's insane. Like we're trying to paddle at the, you know, at the crest of the waves. We're not like tipping over and the wind is pushing this canoe so hard. We physically cannot turn the canoe. The wind was towards least, shore. I'd say like 40 K. It was, it was bad. It got bad. Yeah. And it was just blowing the bow of that canoe broadways into these waves. I and actually, we, it was at that moment. I actually, I a hundred percent thought we were going in. Yeah. Like there's and no this water is cold. Mind. Like there's ice still in the yeah. water. It's cold. So yeah, we started pushing back and we could not. I, I was hoping to kind of tack, which is, you know, I couldn't stay headlong into the wind. So I was hoping to maybe tack a little bit, head straight into the wind for a bit, but then kind of shoot off to the side back with it, with the wind to get back to our, our launch. Absolutely no way was that happening. Yeah. <laughs> so we, we ended up uh, risking it. We got paddled broadside to the waves and shot back as, as best we could to some random guy's backyard. Yeah. <laughs> and we and then, just, he wasn't home thankfully so yeah we, we just quickly like you know pulled the canoe up and we were just like shaking it was like yeah. terrifying and then we just like quickly you know andrew ran you know up the road <laughs> all the way down to the away. car and came back and i was just trying to hide in this guy's backyard and he's like we're not weirdos <laughs> we just didn't want to get wet <laughs> oh that was so yeah that was probably two things i would classify that day as two things one one of the most dangerous canoeing experiences i've had in my life yeah and two one of the best pike fishing days i've ever had yeah. in my life because i said to andrew I'm like <laughs> if it hadn't got windy yeah we would have caught tons of fish that day like we were we were smashing them like it was one of those days where like 
the solar system was lined up and everything <laughs> the stars were aligned and like everything every spot that looked good you caught a fish at yeah you're like you're calling spots like there's a pike here 100 percent. you cast out a jerk bait and then you just see a wake come up because we're fishing shallow and I then love. boom the pike would slam it that's one of my favorite things of pike fishing is uh, so again my my love and desire to actually target pike when i was started when i was younger after i read the scientific angler book and they had these pictures and you're talking about the wake so it's like if you see a wake behind your bait when you're retrieving it that like an added wake it's probably a pike following your bait chasing your bait and i was like i, like, I want to see that i want to have that happen and it never happened when i was at the cottage but when i started fishing spring pike and i'm fishing two feet of water 100 percent, you get a, a you know a 30 inch pike that's chasing down your bait. Oh yeah. There is a big wake behind your bait, and like that is shark. one of the most exciting moments in in your fishing life. Is gonna have the first time you see like a big wake six inches behind your your wake bait that you're running, and you're just waiting for it to take. And half the time it doesn't, and it breaks your heart. Yeah. <laughs> pike. Everyone thinks pike are dumb, and generally I agree with that. But when it comes to fishing, like. I've seen them eat sticks that fell out of a tree while I was snagged in the tree, shaking the branches. <laughs> so again, like I said, they have a they have a pretty good reputation of being dumb. Yeah. That being said, I have seen in clear pressured water in Lake Ontario, I've seen some really big smart ones. You have to think, the yeah. big ones got big for a reason. They're smart. Like I, I, a quick example, I was fishing somewhere with clear, very clear visibility, like 20 feet of visibility. GPS coordinates. Yeah. <laughs> And I was fishing like big, like to get these big pike to even, you know, come to your bait, you got to be using a big swim bait, like an eight you inch swim bait. need to give a big offering. And I was chucking a big, I think it was like a eight inch swim bait and I was whipping it out really far and I was slowly reeling it in and it, out of nowhere, this big pike was just following it. My buddy was like, look, 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 huge pike, huge pike, huge pike. And he was freaking out. And the, the pike was just following behind my bait like it knew it was a lure. It was just like, is this the best you got? And then as soon as it got close to shore, like I ran out of space to reel and I even sped up because I was like, okay, maybe I can trigger this thing. And I yeah. sped up and the fish just like, it didn't speed up. It just was going slow. And as soon as it got close to shore, it just turned and went back into the deep water. Yeah. Kept casting, kept casting. I got him to follow in several times. I tried different lures. Like that particular fish wouldn't touch anything. And I tried glide baits. I tried swim baits. Like maybe if I had a live sucker or something, he would have took yeah. it. But there are times in clear water and pressured water these fish they've been caught they know they're not dumb and and so that's the thing like pike if you can get them on a reaction strike that's awesome if, they, if they're you know kind of on the bite and you're putting something in front of their face and it just like appears like like a jerk bait like something that's you know you're fishing through uh through cover where all of a sudden it comes into their view and it's right there mm -hmm. you can get that reaction strike on them and it's fantastic like they'll hit jigs and they drop down if they're in the yeah. area so but at the same time, I've I've seen, I've fished live bait under a bobber and you'll see a pike come up and just stare at it and then just swim away. And it's live bait like this, yeah. This, but there should be no reason why it's avoiding it. And it's not even pressured water, but sometimes, sometimes it, just, you know, they, just, they just don't want to. That's the thing is when fish are hungry, they'll eat lures, they'll eat baits, but sometimes yeah. fish just don't bite. So what, whether or not it's, it's smarts or not, or just and weird instincts that they're using i don't know but yeah, some some days it just doesn't work yeah so, so you know don't get disappointed if you're seeing in, in the spring you'll see a lot of pike yeah you might not catch a lot so depending on, on what stage they are in their spawn they might not be that interested in what you're doing yeah but there's a lot there they so, do get pretty beat up in the spawn like yeah. you'll, you'll catch a lot of pike in the spring you'll, you'll see pictures of people holding them and, and their fins are really bloody yeah and you're like oh what happened to that fish that's what happens when they spawn they're very violent spawners yes so the males will nip and bite the females. Oh, yeah. So if you end up catching a big one, a big female, you'll see her covered in nicks from from all these male pike. Like and they fight too. Like you'll see big like bite yeah. marks on them, and it's when they fight. I've seen footage of it on uh, like on YouTube of pike fighting when they're spawning, and it's yeah. crazy. Yo, it's nuts. Yeah. Not romantic at all. <laughs> so where is it open to fish pike? So we're talking about spring pike. So like right now, because like right now is April. Yeah. Um, so April right now, zone 17, which a lot of, you know, a lot of our listeners are live in zone 17. It's open year round. Yep. So the Kortha Lakes. Always lot. check for exceptions in the Google yeah, because there there's like sanctuary areas and whatnot. So but like Lake Ontario, which is zone 20, closed. Yep. Any bay off of Lake Ontario, closed. 
like a lot of people will tell me like oh like there are some bays and stuff that are off lake ontario like no no that doesn't count as lake ontario but if you actually look in the rule book it'll show you the actual zone borders you can actually zoom up and those areas are in an exception that is closed so you can't fish for pike in a lot of the bays off lake ontario you can fish for pike in the creeks going up into zone 17 that is considered zone 17. Mm -hmm. so uh, there's a lot of area in zone 17 if you're from this area that you can pike fish 100 percent. but in april a lot of everything else is closed still so you have to use caution like andrew said look at the rule book yep there's lots of random exceptions 100 percent. so yeah zone in zone 20 uh like i just said it's closed in in all of april just into may i think i think like the first saturday of may or the second saturday yeah. of may it opens and then zone 15 or seven or it's the, the week after north, it's, it's a week after yeah that. so what would you say is necessary let's start with necessary gear for pike fishing like what is something that if you're going to go target pike what do you need to have besides rod and reel like we'll talk you about in a have, second what's you know yeah what would be beneficial to have but what is necessary to have to catch you a need pike? to have just a want to have fun. Just kidding. That's a cheat. <laughs> you need to have the power of friendship. <laughs> <laughs> you really should have jaw spreaders. That That's should, a good one. That should literally. You should not not have jaw spreaders. Like you need them, especially if you're fishing hooks with treble hooks yeah. or lures with treble hooks. The, the first thing I'm going to say is is leaders. So again, if someone's oh, yeah, completely sure. new, yeah, uh, into fishing, but pike have teeth, and so the difference. Actually, I want to talk about this, talk about this for a bit. Okay. Is uh, the Essex family, so that includes pike, chain pickerel, walleye. Chain pickerel are not pickerel like walleye. Chain pickerel, they're actually on the east coast. They're coming up from, from the states and whatnot. So they're all in the Essex family. So they look pretty much the same, just different color patterns on the body. Yeah. So those species of fish have blade-like sharp teeth. Whereas a walleye, it has teeth. Like you're not, don't lip a walleye. You're in a world of hurt. <laughs> but they have conical teeth so it's like a cone that comes up in their mouth so line will rub through their teeth against your teeth it's fine it'll get a little chewed up with it with a walleye it's like a needle but point. people it's yeah it's like a needle point however a pike mouth it's like a bunch of tiny like scalpels pointing up so if your line goes through that mouth and like turns it all like, cut gone yeah. so if you're fishing you know, you can you can catch pike on 10, 12 pound mono or, or whatever you're using or 30 pound braid, whatever you want. That's fine. But use a leader. If you're using straight line, you're going to get cut off 100%. If a pike takes that anywhere further than like the back treble of your bait, you're toast. Yeah. I mean, you can get lucky, but if you're targeting pike, 100% use yeah. a leader. Because you don't, here's the thing. You may be like, oh, I don't care if I lose the odd lure, but like you don't want to leave a fish with a huge jerk bait in its mouth. Yeah. That's kind of cruel. And like... I fish a, a like I said, I'll, I'll use the example of an X wrap again. The amount of times I've hooked into pike and the X wrap is completely in their mouth, like you don't see it when their mouth is closed. Yeah, and so you get like just as I said, you get jaw spreaders, and what you do is with those you the, the pike they just like to keep their mouth shut. You get them in the boat, like you're not lipping them, so their mouth just stays clamped shut. So the jaw spreaders go in, it literally forces their mouth open wide. And a long pair of good needle nose, like don't use forceps, get something like long, a long handled needle nose pliers. And then you can get your treble hooks out of that mouth. And then, then your pike is good to go. But you're, <laughs> I have tried to unhook pike and I've successfully done it, but I've, I've ended up with some scrapes after hundred percent. Yeah. And I know even, even you, I remember at the cottage, you're looking like, Oh, I'm going to get this picture of a pike and you're holding his mouth open. <laughs> Yeah. Just, he like shakes his head and his thumb just starts literally squirting blood. I was like, for the gram. <laughs> At that time, Instagram didn't even exist. <laughs> for the gram. <laughs> yeah. It's like, and it's like the one tooth in the front of this pike's like bottom lip. Just and like guaranteed. It's it. always the small ones that yeah. will bite you. And their, their tongue is covered in teeth. Yeah. Like picture a cat tongue, but they're really hard spikes and razor sharp. <laughs> like it's insane. So. They are. Very so that's dangerous. that's that stuff that I would say is 100 percent necessary. You need a leader. So of leaders, there's the common ones. You have wire leader. You can get titanium tieable leader, I like which that. which is nice. And then what I now use these. I used to use wire leaders or nylon coated, but I had a lot break and fail on me over time, yeah. just because it get bent up and stuff like that. So then it weakens the steel. So a little plug for uh, Andrew. 
you got to start. Out. We're making leaders this year. <laughs> we, uh, yeah, so we, we're going to be making uh, some, I can't even think of the name now, fluorocarbon. We're going to make yep. fluorocarbon leaders. But uh, not just the normal fluorocarbon leaders that you can buy from everyone else. We want to make stuff that we particularly wanted to make. Like, even before this, we were like, I was like to Andrew, because he likes to make, you know, leaders and tinker with stuff. I was like, mm -hmm. I want something like this, like this, like this, for this reason. He's like, yeah, we can do that. Can't no. find it at the store, so no. we might as well make it. And yeah. then we're talking to guys, and they're like, yeah, I'd like some of those too. It's like, okay, so we're going to make a bunch. So right now, we're in the test phase of the cool leader that Andrew's making. It's called the just-in-case leader. And this isn't a pike leader, okay? This is a leader for when you're bass fishing, but there might be pike around. I, I think we should break this out when, when we talk about bass then. Okay. But just as a heads up, it's really cool. <laughs> I'm just excited, excited. because it, I it's too. a good leader. I am too. So... Uh, so right, I've now started making fluorocarbon leaders. Yeah, and it, fluorocarbon is a little bit more expensive than steel leaders, like the, or, or they are more expensive. It's hundred percent. But yeah. the benefit with fluorocarbon is, like we talked about in our line episode, if you have any nicks and abrasions on your line, you can see it with fluorocarbon. With braid, you can't. With with steel, you can't. If it's kinked inside or if it's broken inside of that nylon coating, you may not know, and it'll just snap. And then it'll just snap on the next yep. fish because now it's just nylon coating holding that, that lure on. Whereas a fluorocarbon, you can look and say, yeah, I, I see these nicks, but let's say you're using, you know, 80 pound fluorocarbon for pike, which is overkill, 100% for, for most pike applications. Yeah. Um, unless you're targeting like 40 plus inches your whole time, then yeah, just go higher if you want. But if you're just going for your run of the mill pike, an 80 pound leader, I'd have no problem catching four or five fish on that. Or way and, more. Or more, yeah. but like at, at minimum. Like always check your line, but on a steel leader, I could catch three or four, and then I'd be like, it's real iffy if I trust this to catch another one. Because <laughs> pike, they really flop around when you're trying to get them in. They're rolling around in the net, and you look yeah. at your leader, and if you're using just the standard cheap steel leaders, they just kink up, and then they're, they're done. Yeah. So you really have to buy like the titanium leaders, which cost a lot of money, and at the same time, they're really nice, but fluorocarbon is you know so-called invisible right yeah so you get that added benefit but you can see you can look at the leader and be like okay there's a nick there and you yeah. can feel it but you can see it so for me that's the one of the reasons my biggest selling point for me on the fluorocarbon is i can then make my own judgment a lot better as to do i trust this to catch another fish like will i put this back in the water because i can see everything on it i know exactly how that should operate now in the water and generally speaking you go fluorocarbon leaders you get higher in tackle because they're not you're gonna generally you can't find cheap ones of those but the rest of the terminal tackle when i've bought uh, steel leaders in bulk i can't tell you how many times that little clip just busts open yeah or like bends out like you bend it open put your lure and it just breaks off oh it's like, my oh. goodness or like i've pulled it out of the package and like put a lure on. i'm like oh cool and it's like and it just snaps i'm like what the heck yeah. so with the fluorocarbon I have not had any issues with them of, you know, a stupid failure. Yeah. I haven't had a single one. But that's what happens when you buy leaders at Dollarama. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is for average people. That's all they can afford. True. But anyway, so, good things in the work. We do have some fluorocarbon leaders coming. But yeah, we'll talk yeah. about that another thing. But for Pike, definitely some yep. kind of leader you need to use. 100% you need a leader. Yep. So then for other gear then, Jesse, what would you recommend? What would be a great rod if you had to go to someone? Look, they're, they want to buy a rod that's going to suit them for kind of an all around, but for pike primarily. What would what action, what kind of price range would you be recommending they look at? Yeah, so like I always say like price range, buy the best gear you can afford. I'm yeah. not gonna give you a price range because you know, you may be able to spend a hundred dollars on a rod. You might be able to spend five hundred dollars on a rod. So just buy the best one you can get. For me, if I could only have one pike rod, either spinning or bait casting would be the same. I'd get a seven foot, seven foot three ish, medium heavy. Yep. I feel like for what you're going to do, like unless you're fishing smaller jerk baits, which I mean, that can be good at times using slightly smaller jerk baits. Yeah. A medium heavy is great. Like it's a rod you can fish year round for pike. You can use spinner baits on no it. No problem casting like this uh, mid-size X-Wrap on a medium heavy. Yeah. You'd have a hard time maybe casting a husky jerk, but if you're actually going to a you know, a, a more modern jerk bait with a long cast ability and yeah. whatnot, a weight transfer, you'll have no problem casting anything like that on a medium heavy rod. It's always better to have something slightly heavier than you need than something that's too light. So say you got like a medium jerk bait rod, now you can't chuck big swim baits on it. Yeah. So, I mean, I'd say medium heavy, depends where you're fishing, but if you're fishing for big pike and you're chucking big swim baits, you may have to go up to a swim bait rod, which is like a heavy or an extra heavy, but a medium heavy, like that's the rod we always talk about. Yeah. It's the rod that does it's everything. 
And if you know, it's bait casting is good, rod. but spinning is great too. Medium heavy spinning is not a heavy rod. It's just, it's mm -hmm. a little bit more, you know, a little bit more of a kick to it than a medium. That's yeah. all you need. Yeah. yeah. That's all you need. And then I'd load it up with uh, 30 pound braid. Yep. I'd, I'd say it. 30 pound. Yep. I remember like the first time I put on 30 pound braid, I was like, oh, I'm used to using 10 pound mono. That's all I ever used ever. And then I was like, oh, I'll try braid. And it's like 30 pound braid. It's so strong. And I was like, I can rip through weeds. It's amazing. And like it's it's 30 pound braid is probably one of the best all around lines <laughs> oh like, yeah unless you need a specific application like we talked about but it's one of the best all around lines if you told me here's a uh you know a spinning reel and you need to fish for anything with it I'm like, okay i'm gonna put on 30 pound braid and then i'm gonna put a leader on if i need it <laughs> yeah <laughs> I, I i think too a lot of a lot of people they think that you have to use heavier braid because like a lot of the bass fishing content that you see on youtube is like people that live in the states okay yeah so like 50 pound braid is good and all, but 30 pound braid is actually rated high. Like if you buy a like braid and it's 30 pound, it'll actually say right on the spool, it'll be like max breaking strength. And it's usually closer to 40. Yeah. So you're you're using 40 pound braid. So, I mean, it's it's heavy enough for pike. Like you will have no problem catching any pike in Ontario on 30 pound braid, yeah. unless you're chucking big baits, then you should and that, use And that's why, line. and that's, it's yeah, your line is more to, again, we talked about that on our line episode a bit, but you're going to go to a heavier gauge line if you're fishing either structure that you need to protect against or you're fishing through like really thick weeds and yeah you're going to be using 60 80 pound braid some guys yeah. for for bass or if you are uh casting big baits so musky baits you're going to use heavier line because you don't want your 200 hundred dollar musky bait to go flying because your bail closed <laughs> yeah you know or, or something stupid your line tangles and so that's the reason why you'd go higher but for catching a pike if you have 30 pound braid you are overpowered really for that fish for your line strength yeah and but like, it's, it's just good because the it's, average pike isn't that big you're not catching 40 inch pike every cast the average yeah. pike is like two three pounds at the most yeah so you don't so. need you don't need super heavy equipment this is just for the the average person just going to want to catch a few fish use any gear you have you'll catch them yeah just don't be crazy don't use like a you know a little ultra late ice fishing rod <laughs> so that's that's good as like what not to use there yeah but Another thing I know people have asked is is in the past was if you're fishing spring pike, like pike season might be open in your area right now. It might be open shortly. Bass season is not. So how can you avoid catching bass? So we touched on this a few podcasts yeah, back. Yeah, it, it was one of the questions asked by, by the listeners. So I know a lot of people, and it's really annoying because a lot of people will use the excuse being like, they'll fish for bass and they'll be like, I'm fishing for pike. It's yeah. like, you're using a Sanko, yeah. <laughs> you know, like you're not fishing for pike. I'm not saying you can't catch pike on Sankos, but like don't fish slow plastic techniques. Like don't be chucking like flipping jigs or Texas rigs or Sankos around docks and like weeds and stuff like that. Like, dude, you're fishing bass. Yeah. Okay. There's plenty of bass that are in that area that they're, yeah, again, they're, they're cold water fish. Bass but, like, are coming in shallow. They're as really well, that's where the warm. They're looking for the warmest water. Yeah. So pike are getting their ideal temperature pretty much. And bass are just trying to get the warmest temperature they can because they're not there yet. So the warmest temperature though is right up on shore, right in these shallow areas where the pike are. And the problem is like, we've done a little bit of the early season catch and release bass fishing. And generally what we've caught the bass on have been jerk baits. Um, you were fishing what, that little hair jig. Mm -hmm. Like it's just slower techniques. Pike also love those. So I mean like, there, I don't think there's an actual way not to catch bass, but no. definitely I would avoid like specific bass techniques, obviously. 100%. So, so that's that's kind of what I was gonna what I was looking for with that leading question, yeah. was, was exactly if you don't fish for bass, are you gonna catch some? Yes, but target your technique and your area for pike. So like you said, don't be flipping a dock with a sanko and be like, I'm going for pike. <laughs> yeah, because like here's the thing, we've been pike fishing in April on the Kortha Lakes, chucking big you know Len Thompson spoons, and you, you smack a three pound smallmouth. Yep. I'm not, I have a big, you know, fluorocarbon leader and a big spoon on and a small tits. Like, what are you going to do? Yep. You you unhook it quickly, you release I it. I had a six inch uh, swim bait, like oh, yeah. almost, a, I guess a swim bait, not a glide bait. Those big bass will and, smash it. And I caught a, a big smallmouth. And the like, problem is you always catch the biggest smallmouth yeah. when they're out of season. So like a few years ago, I was fishing for pike with a big glide bait and I caught the biggest, not my biggest smallmouth, but one of the biggest smallmouth I've ever caught on a glide bait too. And I had to throw it back and I couldn't take a picture of it. <laughs> and everyone's like, oh, you 100% took a picture. I'm like, I literally didn't because that is one of my biggest pet peeves when people are like, oh, just take a picture and post it later. It's like, it's against the law. Yeah. But 
I don't want to sound like a goody two shoes, but since it's one of my pet peeves, I'm just like, no. I yeah. took a picture of my mind because it was a big, it was a big small, and it smashed a big glide bait. Like that is like everyone's dream, and it happened like three weeks before Bassie's open. Yeah. I was so mad because <laughs> I, I know we've caught we got a couple five pounders together. We had a double header and five oh. pounders, and it was the day before Bassie's. It was the open. day before bass season. <laughs> but like I said, I, that's why I was so happy about last fall. Again, tangent again, but. Last fall with that big smallmouth I caught on the BFS combo. Yeah. That was my biggest in-season smallmouth I've caught. That was a chunker. I love it. Just like so, me. Again, open water. I, I was That was on my last days out on the water, and that was a great time, and I want to open this year. And he with, didn't invite me. It was my dad. Okay, so, fair enough. You know. John, if you're listening to this, I forgive you. <laughs> <laughs> but now he has to listen to this. I'll tell him. Okay. So anyway, yeah, we're uh, approaching the time of the end here. Yes. So now it's time for the AOA Q and A. <laughs> yeah. So we're actually only going to do a few questions. Yep. Um, and they particularly have to do with uh, our giveaway, the kite fish giveaway. So I've actually memorized them and I know who they're from because we're actually only going to do two questions. Okay. Okay. And one of them I did uh, for me and one of them I, I found a good one for Andrew. And the question that I'm going to ask Andrew um, Again, I, f- I forget exactly who asked this, but if you ask this question, you know who you are. So the question <laughs> was about fishing crankbaits for like after trout opener. Mm-hmm. How do you catch fish on crankbaits and is it illegal to use treble hooks in the creek? No, so there it's, it's not illegal to use treble hooks in the creek. There are some areas in Canada where you can't use barbed hooks or you can't use treble hooks. So there's... You have to look in the regulations for your area if you're listening somewhere on the you know east coast or out in BC. But around here, I'm not aware of any creeks that have any restrictions on using treble hooks in in the in the creeks. I think that's like one of those myths that someone's yeah. like, oh, somebody you, told me someone. You, know, you can't like, use a treble hook that's like loaded with a bunch of like one ounce weight, throwing an 80 pound braid through a. a a, cr- a pool full of trout or salmon and snag them. Yeah. That's the kind of trouble hook you can't use because yeah. you're clearly doing something illegal. If you're snagging fish on like spinners or crankbaits in the creek, you're fishing completely wrong. Yeah. You know, steelhead generally aren't just like, yeah. you know. And generally after the steelhead run, it's a bunch of dropbacks. You're not getting generally these, these pools filled with like a hundred steelies coming in. Yeah. You're getting They're all three or four up. or five maybe in a pool. And so you can target. And what's I love, so I love to do that is I'll put on, uh, some like micro cranks so with some some uh, I really like the gamakatsu finesse treble hooks because they're they're thinner gauge so you can fight them on a lighter action rod or a softer rod yeah but they are still strong enough that they're not bending out because I know some of the, like the micro cranks they come with like really really small like crappy hooks they're thin. as in like, like and crappy a like the, the, bend them out. as in the fish species cut type of hook and yeah. the steel hood will bend it out oh yeah so easily uh, they also make some now that uh, like for BFS, for trout fishing with it, that have single like Siwash hooks on it. Yeah, hundred percent. That's fa- that's fantastic. So, what I like to do is you get these baits. Like you get a little re- rubble crayfish, let's say in the creek, or the cricket lure. I love the cricket. Cricket lure. hopper is like my yeah, favorite. The head and cricket bait. or the rebel cricket yeah, hopper. So and black. Um, I like the green one, but I got preference. So you can hold your rod out again, like around here in the East Tribs, you're fishing creeks that are 10, 15 feet wide or something like that. And then I'll put my rod out in front of it and you'll you'll get the depth and this bait will be sitting right in front of the steelhead's face. Just like wobbling right in yeah. front of it. And you just slowly back it up to his face and then you can annoy him into, yeah. <laughs> into attacking that thing. And you'll just kind of swing it back and back and forth in front of his head. And you're just holding your rod there, like moving it back and forth. And sometimes they don't and you leave it be. And sometimes they'll absolutely smash the thing or, or you reel it in fast across the pool right in front of them and they'll fly out from the corner on an undercut bank and Super smoke exciting. that thing. Yeah. Same with spinners and spoons. Like a lot of guys that fish like, you know, float fishing, they're like, oh, you shouldn't use lures in the creek. It's like yeah. at times they can be amazing. Yeah. So use use the, the biggest thing with that is use the current to your advantage. It's yeah. always going to sweep your stuff downstream. So if, if there's a big pile of logs down there, like a big log jam, uh, you know, open up your bale or, or, you know, open your spool, let it drift down and then just close that, hold it there in front, just in front of that log jam. And you can hold it in front of the structure so you're not going to get snagged on it. And it's just working there in the current for you. You don't have and to reel don't in. Don't be afraid to put a few split shot in front because those yeah. little crankbaits sometimes, they won't get deep enough. So yeah. I've had good success putting a few split shot, like, you know, I've even, I've even kind front. of put a, I've tied on with some uh, stoppers. 
I've put a uh, like a quarter ounce egg sinker yeah. in front as well. Like I put it three feet in front of the line, so that comes down, and and it's just that way it stays closer to the bottom of the pool for me. So yeah, all that stuff is is fantastic. That's would be my little tips on fishing a crankbait in the in the creeks. It's fun. Do it. Oh, it's hundred percent fun. And then the last question was someone was asking me if you can use uh, like live worms for steelhead fishing, and the answer is a hundred percent yes. Um, again, most of the time if you're fishing early season steelhead. Um, you're going to be using like egg imitations and you know pink worms and stuff and one of the most popular steelhead baits ever is a pink worm or pinky as they call them so why wouldn't an actual worm work mm-hmm. obviously it works and you can even get the trout worms you can get by dew worms the little or worms, you can buy yeah. trout worms and yeah they're just thinner worms i find like i try not to use live bait unless i absolutely have to that's just me so like i'd rather use plastic worms because generally they work so good that i have no need to use live bait but I find especially after trout opener, um, when the fish, you know, head back to the lake, but there's still a few that are stocked up under log jams and stuff. One of my favorite ways to catch them after a rain too, is a du- big juicy dewworm on a decent sized hook and one or two split shots and I'll let it drift under there. And you'd be surprised the size of steelhead that'll happily gobble up a big dewworm. Yeah. And like you said, little, the little red wigglers are amazing, especially after a little bit of rain, you can float fish some, you can bounce them along the bottom they're fantastic and sometimes it's just that i think it's the extra like little scent or just the ultra you know they're obviously natural because they're real Mm -hmm. sometimes it's the deal yeah but again try to use you know artificial bait when you can because you don't have to worry about it dying you can just leave it in your pack and you don't have to worry about it smelling (laughs) like death from being in your car car. (laughs) yeah everyone knows if you fish the death smell of worms oh it's bad but anyway Uh... so again we'd like to thank uh matt from kitefish for sponsoring the giveaway for this um this podcast again he's giving away five packs of beads one pack of pegs which will deal you for all those five packs of beads yeah and then five packs of plastics and i'm not exactly sure what bead colors or what uh, plastics he's giving away but you're gonna have to talk to him because he's going to be talking to you about that and then shipping it to your house and normally we announce the winner of the actual giveaway on the podcast but since we are a little backed up this week what we're going to do is this is going to be an instagram only uh, giveaway so definitely check us out on instagram and we're yep. going to announce on our stories um, how you can enter and win this giveaway so another thing i want you guys to do because we're going to start doing giveaways where you have to be the first 10 people to enter and that's it so turn on post notifications on our instagram account because i'm going to post something in me and say first 10 people that dm me this message are in the draw and you have to be the first 10 people so make sure you turn on the post notifications of our posts okay nice. awesome so look forward to that. Check out our Instagram, like Jesse said, uh, Average Ontario Anglers, uh, with underscores in between each of those words. And then we have our YouTube, if you're watching us. Hello. <laughs> if not, feel free to check us out. We have our other content on there. And as always, thank you so much for listening to yet another, I'm sure, excruciatingly boring episode of Average Ontario Anglers. <laughs> and we would like to thank you. At the time of this recording... Me and Andrew are really happy. We just passed 1,000 downloads, yep. which is fantastic. Like, it's been going so well. Me and Andrew are really happy. We're really thankful for all the support. We get lots of messages from you guys and girls just telling us like that you like the, you know, the podcast, you enjoy it, and then giving us suggestions on topics that you, you know, you'd like to hear from. So if you have a subjection or not a <laughs> subjection, subjection you subject us to some weird questions. <laughs> <laughs> if you have a suggestion for a topic, definitely let us know because we have the whole year of episodes ahead of us and we'd love to hear from you guys those weeks add up quick so there's 52 different topics in a year that can be discussed yeah for sure so anyway thanks again for tuning in yep. and we'll catch you on the next one episode six yep episode, episode six, six.